Hello and welcome to another video on language families. This is a second related to language families. And today we look at what is called Grimm's Law. We, in, in the last video, we looked at how Germanic was a subfamily of a larger family called Indo-European. We will remember that there's a huge families, I mean, a, a, a complex family of languages called the Indo-European family of languages, within which we have subfamilies like Indo-Iranian, Baltic, Slavic, Germanic, Celtic, Roman, etc. We are now looking at Germanic languages and Grimm's law tells us how some changes came to place in all Germanic languages, but not in other Indo-European languages. We are talking about a consonantal change that happened, affected only Germanic languages and not other Indo-European languages. So, a change unique to Germanic languages, which is called the Grimm's law. Let's look at a definition of what Grimm's law is. As Germanic diverged and evolved from Indo-European, the stop sounds of the parent language underwent a complete transformation. Stop sounds, we will explain what a stop sound is. The stop sounds, they are all consonants in Indo-European, underwent a complete transformation when Germanic evolved as a separate language. Then we know Germanic broke into other languages like English, Dutch, German, Scan um, Scandinavian languages, etc. But this Grimm's law operated before this further divisions of Germanic language happened. These laws have been codified by a man named Jacob Grimm in 1822 and they have come to be known as Grimm's law. They are not really law. We, we, we use the word law, but they are not really law. Law is something that we make artificially, something we prescribe. But Grimm has made a description of something he, he observed. Okay. Here is Grimm, Jacob Grimm. We are, have heard of him. We, we have heard of the Grimm brothers or the brothers Grimm. Willem and Jacob Grimm, they are two brothers. And Jacob Grimm uh, is credited with having categorized the, the, the sound changes we today call Grimm's law. Uh, he was not the person who discovered these changes. There was another gentleman named Rasmus Rask who pointed out. But Jake, it was Jacob Grimm who codified it, who, who made it systematic, who kind of made a good documentation of all the changes with a lot of examples. Now, what is Grimm's law? Grimm's law is about the Indo-European stop sounds or plosive sounds developing into the Germanic. The changes that affected the Indo-European plosive sounds when they developed into the Germanic division. Now, what is a stop sound? You might be familiar with these pictures. We saw it in another video before. I'm going to tell you what a stop sound is. Look at this picture here. We see that the lips are jointed and there is a blockage here. There's a blockage. Air is blocked here. It, air is not allowed to leave the mouth. So such a stoppage, see stop, there yeah, stop, that's a stoppage and then a release. That's why it's also called plosive. A release will cause a plosion. So in the case of b and p, you have the lips closing the air passage and suddenly releasing b, p. So they are two stop sounds. And here the stoppage is caused by the tongue against the alveolar ridge. D, t. There's a stoppage and sudden release. So we call them stop and we also call them plosive because there is a sudden release. D and t are plosive sounds. Of b and p, b is voiced 
and per is not voiced. That means the vocal cords are involved in per and not involved in per. Involved in der, not involved in ter. So der is voiced, ter is voiceless. And the third kind of stop consonant are velar stops. That means the back of the tongue presses against velum or velum or the soft palate and causes a blockage and release. G, k are examples. And of this, g is voiced and k is voiceless. Well, I hope I haven't piled up too much information. Let me explain it quietly again. I mean, slowly again. All these are called stops because there is a stoppage of air passage at some point. Lips, alveolar ridge, velar area. And then there is a sudden release. And these are the consonant sounds in English. B, D, G, P, T and K. B, D and G voiced. P, T and K voiceless or unvoiced. You will remember that a voiced sound, in, in the production of a voiced sound, the vocal cords are active. In the production of unvoiced sounds or voiceless sounds, the vocal cords are not active. They are withdrawn. Okay, that, that's a little bit of um, phenol, phonetics here so that we will brush up our right knowledge about what a plosive sound is. So, Grimm's Law explains how all these stop sounds in Indo-European and Indo-European also had other stop sounds, how they all changed, in the pattern in which they changed when Germanic language evolved from Indo-European. Grimm's Law, uh, there are three stages that we can explain. One is, what happened to the Indo-European aspirated plosives? Now, what is aspiration? We did not talk about that. Plosive sounds, we know. Stop, release. Aspiration is a little h sound. For example, p. We don't have that many aspirated sounds in English. We have a few allophones that are aspirated, but no, no phoneme in English is aspirated. But in Indian language, we have pa, for example. Here, pa is an aspirated uh, plosive sound. So we assume that there was a pa in Indo-European. The quality might be different, but it is similar to Sanskrit pa. So Grimm observes that the, all the pa sounds in Indo-European became b sound in Germanic languages. So the first is, I put a greater than sign. Don't understand it as greater than. It just means that this became this. So this is not mean. Doesn't mean it is greater than just means per became per. Indo-European per became Germanic per. Examples can be prada, which is brother, which became brother, which still remains as brother in English, which is a Germanic language. Pa becoming ba. And the, another uh, aspirated plosive in Indo-European, which we still have in Sanskrit and Indian languages, ruthira, which is blood, became red, which, which is still retained as red. It, it must have gone through so many stages in the Germanic, but finally, today we have that th remaining as d in English, madhu, honey, and th, you have the English word mead, which, have, which has that d sound retained. So, k, I couldn't find any uh, convenient examples in known language, fam languages familiar to me, so I have avoided. But we just need to know that all the p, th, and k sounds in Indo-European became p, d, and k in Germanic languages. P, th, k are aspirated plosives, while b, d, and k are voiced plosives or voiced stop sounds. The second set is the Indo-European voiced plosive sounds. The sounds we saw before, b, d, g are the voiced plosive sounds. Now we are going to look at what happened to the Indo-European b, d, and g. How the Indo-European b, d, and g changed in Germanic languages. So, 
the three voiced plosive sounds in Indo-European, which are burda and g, became voiceless plosives. They lost the voicing in Germanic language. They became p, t, and k. Example for b becoming p is there in the word labia, which we already know. Labia means lip. This is Latin, and it remains in English as lip, b, p, and becoming T, we know Danta and Duo becoming Teeth and Two. So Danta is Sanskrit and Duo is Duo is uh, Latin. D, D becoming T, T in English. So these are all examples for it from English because English represents the Germanic family. I have taken Sanskrit and Italian because they both belong to non-Germanic families of Indo-European and G, K you can see in Sagire uh, in uh, Latin and Sikh G becoming K so B, D and G which are voiced plosives they lose their voicing and become P, T and K in Germanic languages and we have seen a few examples. And the third set of changes is what happened to the P, T and K in Indo-European. So, initially we looked at P, T and K of Indo-European which became B, D and G in Germany. Then we looked at B, D and G of Indo-European which became P, T and K in Germanic. What happened to the P, T and K of Indo-European? Interestingly, they also changed in the Germanic languages. P of Indo-European became F in Germanic. T of Indo-European became TH in English. This is the phonetic symbol denoting TH. And K became, became H. So P, T and K of Indo-European became F, TH and H in Germanic languages. Examples PITA, PITA. Sanskrit, pisces, fish. Latin, we have the per becoming for father and fish in English. Tres and freighter. Tres is three. Latin, freighter is ter in Latin, from which the word fraternal fraternity came, meaning brother. Becoming three and brother in English. This is the today and this is the, three and the, but we are interested in th that um, change from the to this combination. can be the as well occasionally. Anyway, tres becoming three and freta becoming brother. K in the European became H in English. Examples would be kentum, which is hundred word denoting hundred, corda, relating to the heart doesn't exactly mean heart because Latin had um, inflections corda, cordus, cardia, cordi, cor, etc. So we have just taken one form of it. We are interested only really in the C part, K part here, kentum, cordum, and you have hundred and heart and um, K becoming ha. And I would like to add that the word hardavam related to heart and related to the English word cordial. It's very interesting, this similarities. Keep, from today onwards, keep an eye for these similarities, how many, many Indian words are similar to European words. And in Dravidian languages also we will find this because Dravidian has borrowed extensively from uh, Sanskrit. So many words in Dravidian languages also will be familiar, similar to uh, European other Indo-European languages, those loan words from Indo-European. Okay, so that is what happened in the uh, under Grimm's law. And uh, please look at this picture here. Uh, don't look at this now. Look at let, let's remove him now. Look at these pictures here. Indo-European P became B in Germanic. Indo-European B became P in Germanic. 
Indo-European the became fur in Germanic. Indo-European the became the in Germanic. Indo-European the became the in Germanic. Indo-European the became the in Germanic. Indo-European ke becoming ge in Germanic. Indo-European ge becoming ke in Germanic. Indo-European ke becoming he in this X can mean ha in Germanic. So that is Grimm's law. Grimm's law tells us a few sound changes well codified which happened when Indo-European or rather when the Germanic branch broke from the Indo-European. So this is a very important set of um, observations that Jacob Grimm made. Jacob Grimm was a German philologist as we know and uh, now we go on to look at a few sound changes that was different from how Grimm explained it. They did not seem to work in the way he explained it. For example, in the word ocular, ocular is a non-Germanic word, it's a Latin word. The K sound should have become her sound in Germanic. But we see that it became G. Look at this word Eage from which modern English I came. It becomes in the Germanic form it is G. Instead of ke, it instead of becoming he, it becomes ge. So according to Grimm's law, ke became he in Germanic. But here, ke becomes ge. And in the words peta and pita, both ter sounds, both are non-Germanic. Uh, peta is Latin and pita is Sanskrit. We have the Old English word father where the ter becomes de rather than fa. It should have been father, but it became father later in modern English. That is due to some other change. In Old English, which we take as representing Germanic, the change is de to de. So, it should have become fa, but it became de. This is not something that Grimm, that could be explained by Grimm's law. According to Grimm's law, te became fa, but here te becomes de. Same can be seen in Kentum. In the first part, ke becoming he is according to Grimm's law. Latin Kentum, Germanic, here it is English, ke sound, he sound, ke becoming he is explained, explained by Jacob Grimm, ke becoming he, but the te becoming de is not according to Grimm's law. According to Grimm's law, te should have become the. It should be hundred, but it is hundred or yeah. So it is de and not the. Now this is a problem. This is something that troubled Grimm and other philologists. Something that uh, seemed to see did that did not seem to fit into the set of explanations that are codified under Grimm's law. And uh, an explanation to this was given by um, a Danish philologist named Karl Werner, which we call today Werner's Law. So, what Werner said was, Indo-European per Turke, which according to Grimm's Law became fur, the and her in Germanic languages, worked like that only when the stress fell on that syllable or in a neighboring syllable. So when, this, or rather, this change was heavily dependent on the phonetic environment of that sound, the per sound, becoming fur. The per becoming became fur only when these sounds occurred in a stress position or when, a, when the stress was on a neighboring sound. When these sounds occurred in an unstressed position or where the stress was not anywhere near, per, ter and ker became per, der and ger instead of fur, ter and her. So that is the explanation that Werner gave. Let us look at it in detail. Proto-Indo-European, per, ter and ker. 
don't look at this branch right now yes we will look at later proto indo european or indo european part and her according to grimm's law became her sir and her in germanic languages but werner said that it part and her became her sir and her only when they occurred in stressed positions for her and her in unstressed positions these part and her became her der and her that is the explanation that uh, uh, the neat explanation to the problem that karl werner gave which is today known as werner's law werner also added that the indo european sir sound became remained sir in germanic languages in stressed positions in unstressed positions indo european sir became sir in germanic languages so that is the complete set of werner's law per turk and sir of indo european becoming remaining so in a stress positions but becoming ber de ge and ze in unstressed positions that is werner's law yes so and this sir which became ze in unstressed positions later de developed into ra sound it was but in medial positions the ze became ra in english uh, this is ze becoming ra is explained by a uh, by by a phenomena called rotacism rotacism is an explanation of how ze sound became ra well here we'll we have a few examples how ta in the european becoming became de orth this sound this letter here is a germanic letter for th so ta in these two forms of the old english words these are old english words which don't have modern equivalents we are then we are wurden worden in these two forms you have ter becoming ver but in these two forms which th th this is explained by grimm's law but this is explained by werner's law where ter becomes der wurden worden same word different forms in old english and in the same way if you look at uh, the old english words chaosen chaos kuron koren which are which are relatives of choose chose etc of modern english you can see that in these two forms s remains as such but in these two forms s becomes r we don't have a modern equivalent of kuron and koren but we we know that these are the old english forms chaos and chaos kuron and koren here you have werner's law operating and these two words we have grimm's law operate and in a modern english example for sir becoming r can be seen in was where so wessen was were on so the sir in was modern english and r in where are the perhaps only remaining uh, or a rare instance of the r sound in modern english well the, the, these are examples we have already seen where ker becomes ger and ter becoming der according to werner's law and kentum ter becoming der where in the same word we have both grimm's law and werner's law ker becoming her by grimm's law and ter becoming der according to werner's law now these images will give us a concluding understanding of these two laws this is grimm's law per the her of indo european becoming per de and ge in germanic per de and ge of indo european becoming per te and ke in germanic per te and ke of indo european becoming fer the and her in germanic but in some cases the per te and ke became ber de and ge so you have that uh, and also sir becoming r is another feature and th these are explained by werner's law so that is grimm's law and werner's
thank you for listening and these two are very important laws we'll we need to look at a few more sound changes that happen in the evolution of english uh, which includes ablot or vowel gradation which tells us why in some verbs we have which are called strong verbs like like teach taught ride road eat ate eaten we have the same word changing the vowel inside the word changing and sometimes we say walk walked and talk talked by adding ed these two are there but why the strong verbs came we will learn through the sound change called ablot and the mutation will tell us e mutation of umlaut will tell us about why some english nouns have a, have a different kinds of plural like why goose is geese and not gooses and how you you know how words like strength evolve from strong all these we will be able to understand better when we study e mutation of umlaut and also vowel great vowel shift is another important sound change we need to look at uh, which happened uh, in the in the middle and modern english periods uh, well we we hope to look at those in further videos but until then thank you very much once again and all the very best to you